So you can see it's kind of an independent little arty British movie coming your way. Uh, let me bring out the director of Kick-Ass, of Stardust, uh, the producer of Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, the director of X-Men First Class, and now Kingsman, The Secret Service, Mr. Matthew Vaughan, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Matthew, so um, let's start with the movie. First of all, obviously we get a fair idea from the trailer, but how would you describe it? What were you hoping to achieve? What kind of film is it that we, we have waiting for us? It's a postmodern love letter to every spy movie ever made. And um, basically we felt the Bonds and the Bournes are great, but they're very serious. And I wanted to re well, just grab all the, um, the movies I loved, the old, you know, old Bond, in like Flint, Man from Uncle, Get Smart, and do our own modern version. It's got, a, I mean, obviously it is very modern. There's a, it's very violent in a very colourful way. In a uh, Tom and Jerry manner. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you worry ever that that kind of violence, that kind of humour is more English than American, that it wouldn't travel? Did you test it out on American Friends? Friends? <laughs> American staff. No, American um, strangers. When you test screen, you don't know. They'll be like, what we're doing now, but we show the film and then we ask, what makes, does, you know, is it too slow? Is it confusing? Um, I don't really ask if it's too violent or funny because I think that's a very subjective point of view. So you rely on your own instinct when it comes to that? Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you about the origins of this, because it, it was a comic first, but I believe you were involved in the idea for the comic before Mark Miller and Dave Gibbons produced that. It was an afternoon in the pub with Mark Miller, and Mark and I, as I said earlier, were, we, were, we just said what happened to when we were kids, we saw spy films and we wanted to pretend to be the spy. And um, so Bond is like a British superhero. We don't really have, you know more than me, that there's not many, Brit apart from what, Captain Britain, which no one knows. Um, Captain Britain is lame. Exactly. Um, and probably have King Arthur, we don't, you know, Sherlock Holmes, but they're all, they're not, they're the more realistic figures. And uh, But we wanted to make a movie that was, um, what well, we said that they're serious films that didn't take themselves seriously. Why can't we do the same thing? Have you heard from the Bond people? Because I know you know the producers of the Bond series. Have they seen this? Do you know if they're... Because I think we're all aware the Bond films were kind of painting themselves in a corner with... They, they, were, they were getting it quite wrong, I think. And then the Bond movies came along and that gave them a kick. And they kind of came back with a different kind of Bond movie. I'm wondering whether we'll see the influence of, of Kingsman on the next few Bond movies. I think if Kingsman's successful, then they'll take note. <laughs> So, but it's already been a big hit in, in the UK and in all the parts in Europe. It's opened it. That's true. That's true. So, they, I mean, Moonraker was um, when uh, Star Wars became a huge hit. Um, they made Moonraker thinking everybody wanted to see Bond in space. And as you said, Bourne was a big influence on Casino Royale. Listen, they're making a lot of money and it's working. So I don't know. You have to ask the broccolis, not me. Before we go to uh, the first of the two clips we're going to show, let me ask you about um, the casting, because Colin Firth is known essentially more for his kind of romantic comedies or playing sophisticated but not necessarily sort of hard, tough or aggressive men. Uh, and so this is a kind of unusual piece of casting, and I'm assuming that was deliberate. Well, we were looking for a modern-day David Niven, and, um, and also there's a scene... Well, what scene are we showing? We're going to show, well, I'll, I'll, we're going to show oh, the right. scene in the bar, the first kind of where you see him in action. Okay, so show the scene and then I'll explain. I don't want to ruin the scene, but okay. we, can't, we wanted a modern day gentleman, which um, Colin Firth definitely is. Well, before we show it, because I, I've heard you say, or I think I've heard you say, that the character of Harry Hart, which is the name of um, the Colin Firth in the movie, is the closest character in any of your movies to you in real life. <laughs> he is, yes. <laughs> so let's watch this scene and see whether you still are going to claim that's the case. So this is, do you want to set this up? Uh, this is the scene where, well, what scene is it? It's in the fucking bar. Okay, We've I just want to check. So, okay. Um, this is the scene where um, Eggsy is a street kid who's pissed off um, or annoyed even um, other street kids by stealing their car and they're trying to find him. And in the meantime, um, Colin has just bailed him out of prison and is deciding to have a chat with him about why are you such a bad kid. 
kind of like an absent father trying to put him on the straight and narrow. Okay. Exactly. And then this happens. And bear in mind, this is, this is Matthew on screen, supposedly. <laughs> well, I might be the other character. <laughs> okay, yeah. here it comes. <laughs> so, Harry Hart, a.k.a. Matthew Vaughan in action there. So, you can't do any of that stuff. Not yet. <laughs> but I do notice you've given Colin Firth your glasses to wear in the film. So, there is a kind of element of you bleeding this in. Yeah. No, I put my, my glasses. I have a double-breasted suit, believe it or not. And, um, yeah, no, I, there was a lot of me in that character. Let me ask you about casting young Taron Egerton in the role, because he's, another, he's a discovery of yours. This is his first feature film. Quite an unusual thing for someone to pluck a, a complete unknown with no screen time that I'm aware of. He'd never done a film. Never, never done, done a film anything. before. Yeah. But you have a track record of doing this, of course. Aaron, who you put in Kick-Ass, was a newcomer. And really, uh, Daniel Craig, in part, owes, I think, the part of Bond to you, because you cast him in Layer Cake, which was not the kind of movie that he'd been in previously. Yes. There's a question there somewhere if you want to do a bit of work. You carry on. It wasn't what a question. do you look for? How do you find them? And how hard is it to sell it to a studio, in this case Fox, when it's a complete unknown in a lead role? Very hard. Um, but the good news is they couldn't figure out a movie star that was right for the role. So that gave me um, the freedom. And, and as you said, with Fox, we argued about putting Jennifer Lawrence in uh, X-Men. So I sort of... That worked out pretty good. So it's, they, 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 they trusted me for, um, when it comes to casting. Okay. Uh, we talked earlier about the kind of, and you can see there, there's a kind of almost cartoon vibe. It reminds me at times of like a Warner Brothers cartoon back in the day. Um, but once again, how much interference or how much involvement did the studio have when looking at your plans for the movie and what you wanted to do? How happy were they with that? How much did they trust you? Their trust was 100%. Actually, they were really, really good. Um, there were two scenes that terrified them. <laughs> quite rightly so and um, I had to really really work hard to make sure they uh, okay. pulled them pulled without off. giving stuff away I'm, I'm yeah. assuming one of them will use the phrase is the church scene one is the church scene okay and the yes. second one is that the the shot at the end no no no, no. I forgot about that one as well yeah, oh, three. so there's three okay. yeah <laughs> what's the other um, one the other one was um, a fireworks display using people's oh, yes. heads yeah Okay, so, and that was because of what? Because of what they thought the reaction might be in the audience or just because they are the tone in the film itself? I think their job is to try and make as much money as possible and therefore the lowest common denominator works and my job is to push the boundaries and try and be more entertaining and um, Sometimes that you know those two, you know, they don't match up very well. Let's put it that way. But that's what's interesting about you, I think, as a filmmaker. One of the things mm. is you you are keen on making films which are as broadly commercial as possible. You see it as a business, and you want to mm. reach an audience with this entertainment. Uh, the other side of it, you don't want to follow others, and you don't want to play it too safe. So, is there a battle within you ever to actually think, okay, well, maybe I'm going a bit too far, and this, you know, we want this movie to open as big as possible. Perhaps I shouldn't push it quite as hard. Depends on the rating. I think because we knew we were going to be an R-rated movie, you might as well be an R-rated film because people, if, you know, you don't want to be like Die Hard. What was the last Die Hard called? Forever or Die Live Hard, Young or Have a Lovely Day or something. I think it was yeah, some, some it was weird. Good morning, Die Hard. A good a day, good to, die day hard. to die. Is there ever a good day to die hard? With a, yeah. So yeah. they tried to make that into a PG-13, and then it got an R anyway. So it was a very weak R. So that's a waste of time for me. I'm, I'm more interested, if I'm going to be an R, be an R. If I'm going to be PG-13, then I'll chase the bucks. Let me ask you also about, uh, and this kind of goes back to the studio as well, um, without, I'm not going to give any spoilers here, because I want everyone to go and see it, because I think you will love it. If you've ever liked a Bond movie or The Avengers, films which have that Britishness, or in like Flint, the old James Coburn spice series, I'm sure you will enjoy this movie, and indeed if you've liked Matthew's other films. But, uh, but by some, The Avengers, you don't mean... Not The, the Avengers, Avengers, the movie, yes, The Avengers, sadly. the TV series. No one likes Avengers, the movie, even the people who are in it. Um, but if you uh, were speaking to the studio in advance, most people, when they're making a movie like this, are looking to the possibility of it being a franchise, it going on with other movies, and therefore you wouldn't want certain characters not to survive. Without saying who, of course, quite a few characters don't survive. Did you have battles with that? Were you concerned about that? Did you have second thoughts? And now that it does look like it's going to be a huge hit, do you regret any of the deaths you inflicted on your poor characters? Uh, no, because the audience... 
the good you have no idea what's going to happen in this movie and you and anything could happen and sometimes does which means as an audience member you're on the edge of your seat and um, I think that's more important that you make a film that's good and then a sequel might happen than if you make a bland movie there won't be a sequel so you have to be true to your art before we show the other clip and we turn to talk about Kingsman there'll probably be some people right here in the store and people watching online who are who want to work in the film business, who want to be filmmakers, either writers or indeed producers, which is where you began, yeah. or directors. And I'm interested that you were a producer who then became a director. Was that always your goal when you were producing? When you started out with Guy Ritchie, did you deliberately let him have the director's chair first, or was it watching him and thinking that you could do it that inspired you to go on and take the mantle? Um, You're no. smiling there. What, what, what personal joke are you enjoying there that we'd like you to share with us? I, well, whether to really be, you've told me off for being too honest. Well, in the you past. Can, it depends how honest you. I think you'd be honest yeah. about you and um, Guy and what you're. No, I basically became a director because directors pissed me off so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought they were sort of megalomaniac, ego-driven. And you're not. I'm, well, I'm become, I've become a director, so yes. But um, I, I just wanted to prove that it couldn't be that difficult, and. Um, so Layer Cake, I had no aspirations ever to be a director, and and, and Layer Cake, um, Guy Ritchie was going to direct it, and decided not to, and a lot of other directors said no to it. So I just thought, you know what, let's have, a, let's have a go. And do you now feel that you found your forte there? Because obviously you do do it, and you do have a, di a distinctive style. I can tell when it's one of your movies. So you you do have that. It isn't like a, just a safe pair of hands telling a story in a bland way. There's a there's a personality in the way you tell it by just I don't know yeah, that's what, what, what is that personality well uh, we're trying to work out yeah so you, well there's you know you're dressed like the shadow today you know what I mean <laughs> um, you, but, but how would you advise you know people trying to get in the business because you and Guy went out with Lockstock and yeah. you had no money yourselves you were, yeah. I know you had nothing left uh -huh. and you held on to something there but how did you achieve that what, what, what advice would you give to people um, work hard believe in yourself and um, it's not difficult making a film in the sense that it really is just a camera and a, some actors in front of it so if you've got any talent you can make that work and nowadays with I mean my daughter with these iPad things that you guys have which I find confusing still we're in the um, Apple store everyone knows what an iPad yeah. is <laughs> but did, yeah okay um, but my my daughter's doing these pop videos which are, I couldn't do it you know. Okay. Um, let's have the second clip. Now, this is, I believe, and this really harks back to something which Bond appears to be missing, I think, and I'm assuming that's why he did this. This is when Eggsy is shown by Harry Hart, the back of the store that is the front for their organization, and he's given, the, he's, he's given a kind of peek behind the scenes and some of the gimmicks and the gadgets that are involved yeah. here. How heavily involved were you in, in what they were? Re well, watch it, and then I'll explain. I okay, think it's here we go. Here's the second clip. In the film, one of the characters says, uh, I think Colin Firth is talking to Samuel L. Jackson, who's in the film, um, who never gives a bad performance. And he says, I always thought the old Bond films were, the, the spies were only as good as their villains. And of course, the villains you have here, you have Samuel L. Jackson, and you have Sophia playing Gazelle. Uh, and tell us about, if you haven't seen this already, Gazelle's special abilities. What I'll do firstly is answer your last question. And then, yeah, okay. <laughs> so... Um, there are a lot more gadgets than the shoes, so they cut it um, off. But what we wanted to do was in the last Bond movie, Q says to Bond, you know, we don't do gadgets anymore. And I was like, what? Well, a, why not? And so we sort of brought back all the old gadgets, sort of, you know, the hand grenade, which is a lighter, the pen that fires a dart, everything that I'm convinced if you're a modern spy, you still want. If, you know, it'd be, if you're in, you know, in the CIA and something goes wrong and you've got a gadget, use it um jack bauer would find it a lot easier having these gadgets so um so there's lots of gadgets in the film so and that's you missing that in the modern bomb movies missing it and actually generally thinking these old gadgets would work and it was fun actually we, actually, we made the, all the gadgets which was fun tell me then about once again that was that question tell us then about sam jackson so tell this, me about yeah. sophia who plays gazelle and where you found her because i hadn't seen her in a film before either i don't think gazelle is cool she um she hadn't done a movie either, and she, she's, you'll see, she's like our equivalent of Jaws or Odd Job. Um, she doesn't have legs. She has um, blades, which she can jump around and cut people in half with, and she is 
awesome. And Sam Jackson, there's a reason why he's a legend. He's just, um, I think he's, he, this movie r will remind you why we all fell in love with Sam Jackson. You work with many other kind of big screen names who we would think have a kind of legendary status. Obviously, Robert De Niro cast yeah. against type somewhat in Stardust. Yeah. Um, Michael Gambon, who is certainly well known to, to English film fans, I'm sure you know for the Harry Potter movies as well as maybe his stage work. You, you don't seem remotely, I guess you can't be, but remotely intimidated by working with these guys, even when you ask them to do extraordinary things. No, the, I got starstruck. This is the first movie I've been starstruck because um, Mark Hamill is in it. And from my generation, to have Luke Skywalker in front of your camera, um, it blew my mind dealing with him. Can I ask you whether this is true? I heard that when you had Michelle Pfeiffer in Stardust, mm -hmm. on the first meeting, you confessed to her what your favorite film was, and she thought you were being ironic, sarcastic, or just mean. Yeah, I, and it was a genuine statement. I told her that I loved her in Greece too. Um, <laughs> And uh, I did. She was beautiful in it. I was like 11 years old and she was stunning. And still one of your favorite films? Scarface is now a little bit better, but I, you know, it's, it's still my guilty pleasure. Scarface would have been so much better if there'd been a pink lady in it, though, wouldn't it? Well, she virtually is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, uh, so working with Sam, working with Gazelle, they're obviously your first choices there. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the film has opened superbly well throughout Europe. Do you, you're not a confident person in advance, you never count your chickens, no. um, but if it does well over here, and I don't want to jinx it for you, I'm hoping it does, and I'm pretty sure it will, have you already started thinking about sequels? Because it's the kind of thing people, if they enjoy it, would definitely want more of. We'd love to do a sequel, and um, the, the sequel will be set in America. The, in, this is a real celebration of England, and um, I'd love to celebrate Americana and bring back the Marlboro Man. Bring back the Marlboro Man. Bring back the Marlboro so Man. So it's more. It would have He'll more. He'll be, be the Marlboro Kingsman. Uh, sort of a, a sort of a more either a, a cowboy vibe or just a tobacco industry vibe. Which way are you going? The modern day cowboy who doesn't not, smoke. Not the modern day smoker. Okay, uh, we're going to open it up. I hope you have some questions for Matthew. Um, and we've got a little while, or maybe 15, 20 minutes, please. Uh, there was someone over. Let's go to this gentleman in white, and we'll come down to you next. This gentleman in the white there. Hi, Matt. How's it going? Um, I Good. love this movie. I did get to see it twice in um, other screenings, and it did exceed my expectations. And screenings not downloaded. Yeah, of course not. Good. Of course not. Okay. Well, yeah, um, so. I'm, I'm really curious, as someone who wants to go into film, um, with movies like Kick-Ass, which is one of my favorites in X-Men First Class, you still tend to maintain this um, having fun. No matter how dark it gets, you still have fun with it and keep this central theme. And how do you do that as a filmmaker, like staying true to yourself and not taking yourself too seriously and just like having a little fun with it? I, um, as I said, I'm a producer turned director, so I didn't really have, I wasn't, I didn't consider I was a director. I thought I was winging it. So I thought the best way to con people was not make them laugh and don't give them too much time to think. That's why I have a lot of characters and a lot, you know, if I'm thinking if it's getting a little bit boring, switch to another character and make the person laugh. So it's my um, get out of jail technique. Let's go. There was a young woman down here and another young woman there. We'll go to these two uh, next, if that's okay. Hi, Hello. I too saw the movie. It was oh, excellent. Thank uh, you. I, my question is about the young lady Gazelle. Yes. Is she some sort of, did she have some sort of special Olympic ability or did you find her from the Special Olympic? Because she was very gymnastic. I mean, the way she did with those oh, Do you mean Special Olympics? Is yes, Special Olympics for... As in dis disabled yes, people. Yes, disabled people. No, she had legs, um, but she's a backing dancer for Madonna originally. And um, yeah, and we tested, a, we really actually wanted to cast somebody who had a disability because I thought it would be great for them. And um, we couldn't find someone who um, could act. And um, so we cast her, and she, I think she did a great job. I know you met with some people who competed in the Paralympics and had obviously great yes. strength and great skill, but I know you found in but the But they found the acting hard. Yeah, which is, would be ultimately where they yeah. fall down, of course. Let's go to the young woman next to you, if that's all right. So there you go. Thank you. Hi, um, I also saw the film in a special screening in November that you actually opened, and when you were introducing the film, you said that there were concerns that it was too British. So I was wondering, um, I guess in two parts, the first part, what, would, what did you mean by being too British, and were there any, based on the feedback that you got, were there any changes made to the film based on that? Uh, um, 
English and American culture is incredibly, we, we sort of share a language in, 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 you know, in a way. We, we do to speak in a very different manner and have, use different words. And, and I was worried that we really were fully British and it's a British sense of humor, but it played. You were there in November, so um, we didn't change a frame. So obviously there is a, Monty Python pulled it off here and um, Benny Hill, wasn't he quite big here? Benny, yeah. Um, so every now and then we do it. I mean, Ricky Gervais, is he, did he yeah. do okay here? But he, he did well here, didn't he? Yeah. Did he? Sort of. Yeah. Um, for a you, while. For a while. Uh, but you <laughs> no, but, but there are elements of Penny Hill and Monty Python in this, I feel. And I guess, was that deliberate? Well, Mon 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 Monty Python were, were geniuses. And a big inf I mean, the head's exploding is pure Monty Python, if you think about no it. No spoilers. So, yeah. Heads may or may not explode. Yeah, the heads that might explode in a... The exploding heads we're talking about in the kind of figurative sense. Exactly. <laughs> um, as, a, as a comedy concept. Let's, we have time for some more. We shouldn't tell. Let's go to, let's go to this gentleman here and then I was this young woman here, if that's all right. And then I'll definitely come over there. So keep your hand up, sir. You're next, I promise. The Biker. Okay. Hi, uh, Matthew. Um, also, hey. great fan, great film. It was amazing. Um, my question to you is, uh, as you were producing and you got into directing, you mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of experience. And what kind of mistakes and what would you like to tell yourself like what problems did you have as a first-time director that you could share with us who wants to become a director in the future um dealing actors can be really difficult and um i sort of i my the biggest mistake i did because guy lich does well guy richie's when i used to work with him really treated actors like meat puppets and um and I thought that was the way you did it as well. <laughs> so, and he line read, does, did, he used to always do line reading. So on my first day, I was giving Michael Gap. You, line reading is when the the director goes, you know, literally says the line how he wants it to be. So he says, expect, to say it this way, which actors understand. Not say it this way. Hate, they, but they, no, it's you, worse than that. They they do the they read they the line. They give you inflection and everything. Exactly. So um, so you're basically asking an actor to copy you. And I thought that was normal. And then Daniel Craig took me to one side and said, look, you cannot give live reading to Michael Gambon. He really knows what he's doing. And, and I was like, and I, was like, I generally thought that's how you directed. So I did make a few, few genuine mistakes not knowing. And then, you, you know, life's about making mistakes and then learning from it and move on. But oh, if you want to direct, just do it. Um, and we're going to go to this young woman here next, please. <laughs> Hi, Matthew. Hello. So I have a two-part question. Um, okay. You said your two main, two of your main characters, you had, they had never acted before. So I was wondering what drew you to them, how did you find them, and as someone who is an actress, what would you suggest to do to find someone like you, <laughs> to cast them in a movie? Okay, like got it. Um, first, they, well, they, uh, Taryn went to a drama school, uh, a very probably the best one in England called RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, and. Uh, he had an agent, so the agent got him in for an audition, and he just was amazing. So um, I normally cast someone within 15 seconds of them starting to act. You just know they become the character, and, and what you see is what I see. And the difference is then I just have to get them in focus. And, and casting is, you know, John Huston said, you know, directing is 90% casting and he's right really is right if you it doesn't matter how well you tell the story how well you light it how good the music is if the actor sucks you're in big trouble so um and um how, how you want to make it how, how to become an actress or you are you working or you're not working you got a good agent it's a bit of an oxymoron that statement but um there are a few good ones out there and and you just got to keep, be prepared. What really impresses me when someone comes in and they actually know the lines, and um, and if you think you screwed it up, say, look, be honest as well. So I really mucked that up. Give me one. Can I do it one more time? Um, and just do it. Do your best. Good luck. Okay, we'll go to the gentleman down there. I think we might then be running out of time. I'm not sure we have two. We can do two more. Two okay, more. Gentleman, so two more. No pressure on the last one. Think about it. Don't put your hand up unless you know it's going to blow us all away. Okay. <laughs> So um, I was speaking with Dave Gibbons, and he mentioned doing the sequel in America, uh, the United States, rather. And um, he said he's working on a character named Uncle Sam. Is that something you've heard of or are willing to work with? Yeah, Uncle Sam is um, 
the, it's one of the yeah, it's one of the ideas. Um, as, as no, I don't know, he's got a big mouth, Gibbons already. He's not going to be talking. <laughs> You've uh, just opened a world of pain for Dave Gibbons. You know that, don't you? Yeah. Um, so yeah, he can put that in the comic, and then I'll decide whether I want to put it in the movie. But um, 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 but um, yeah. So, so, but as I said earlier, I'd love to love to reference all the American spy movies. Would you go straight into the sequel, or would you do another movie first? Uh, if I can find another movie I want to do, I'll do that first. And if I can't, I'll go straight into the sequel. Okay, if so if for, the film's a hit here. For our last killer question, and before we get to that, I should say, Matthew's lucky enough to work with probably the best uh, scriptwriter in the business, the best screenplay person in the business. She is. Uh, and how did you, how did you find uh, working with her, and how does she keep you in control? Well, she was married to the most difficult man on earth. and um, My wife. Which his wife. <laughs> and so... Um, uh, she escapes from Jonathan by spending time with me. So it's simple uh, as And that. I'm the one who has to pick up with her coming on with that fucking Matthew. Yeah. Like that all the time. Okay, last and vice question. vice versa. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, last question. Who's brave enough? Who's foolhardy enough? Who's smart enough? Gentlemen over there, here we go. Let's hear this killer question. Hey, uh, I loved Kick-Ass and I loved the Kingsman. I saw that too. And uh, also I love the comics. But like right. both of them... Uh, are a little bit different. There's a ch some changes from the comics. And, yes. And um, how do you decide on uh, what to keep or what not to keep or what to uh, change around? Or like the character in Kingsman, the, the the girl with the shoes. She, the legs. The, the legs. She was by Blades. a man, yeah. right? Um, in the comic. Uh, how do I just? Uh, my job is to make a good as film as possible, and. Um, Mark Miller's very good at two-dimensional characters, and we have to make them more three-dimensional on film. And Kingsman, the biggest change was he made the Colin Firth character the uncle. And this movie is sort of like a modern-day Pygmalion, My Fair Lady, Trading Places. And it doesn't really work if your uncle has already done the transformation and says, come on, do the transformation with me. So I want there's no conflict. So that's why we made it Strangers and one kid from the streets and then a, an elitist guy coming together. So it's more about creating conflict and drama, which the comic doesn't need as much. So it's a different form. What serves the film best is what you're looking for, obviously. Exactly. As Mark, Mark can get away with just doing ideas and a bit more fluffy. Um, thank you very much for being here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, will you join me in saying thank you, Mr. Matthew Vaughan, ladies and gentlemen. A brilliant producer, writer, director. Tell your friends to go and see Kingsman. It's Thursday night previews all over America, and then it opens in American Canada on Friday. I believe everything in the Apple Store is now free to you for the next 20 minutes. So what do you... Oh, no, I made a mistake. That was yesterday. Sorry. Thanks for coming, everyone. Have a great time. Enjoy the movie when you...